Running a restaurant is a two-stage story. Front stage is where your customers eat delightful food, and backstage is where your staff prepare that food and manage restocking of supplies. To make profit, you need to have clear picture of both these processes: how the money is coming in and how it's going out. Now the problem is that the backstage picture is sort of blurry. Because the whole process of inventory management, from purchasing supplies to taking deliveries, is cumbersome and not streamlined. Unfortunately, restaurateurs today are still dependent on the archaic methods of ordering, purchasing, and accounting, which is ineffective and stressful for your employees. Wouldn't it be amazing if the whole experience of purchasing is streamlined? There certainly is a lot to understand. When it comes to purchasing and everything that we have to do in the restaurant industry to make sure that we safeguard things and that we do it effectively, welcome to Chapter Eleven, Pro Start Two Culinarians. This is Chef Hawks, and we are going to dive right into purchasing. So, what is the function of purchasing? So, first thing that we need to do in order to have something that's effective is to determine. The wants and needs of our operation. So this is where buyers and、uh, managers are working together to try and figure that out. So we can have different items from items we order frequently, maybe like some flour to make bread,、um, but then we also have one-time purchases, purchasing that brand new oven. All these things in between here, we need to make sure that we have systems in place to do this effectively, safely,、um, and making sure that we get the right thing at the right time. The second step、um, in our purchasing function is to identify the quality standards, and this is where we're going to work on what our specifications or specs are for the products that we're going to purchase. We need to write down some detailed descriptions of exactly what's expected, what qualities we're looking for, and what we need. So this would actually show all the characteristics that are going to fulfil the purchaser's need. So step three in this system is to actually go ahead and order the products and services. So, depending upon the size of your organization,、uh, you may look at a small business where you may just place those orders over the phone. In a larger organization, we'll quite possibly have computer systems and purchase orders. We're going to talk more about those in a little while. Step four is when we would receive the deliveries. You have to make a decision then. So as we're checking every single delivery, do we accept it or do we reject it? Are they up to the standards, standards and specifications of what we ordered? Always verify the products meet those specifications. Next, we need to store and issue those products. So what does this mean to store and issue? So we have to store them quickly so that they're placed away, so that they're safeguarded, and also, especially for things like refrigerated or frozen foods, that they don't deteriorate. Once that is done, now we need to start issuing the product out to where it's needed. So that could be that we have a hundred cans of peaches, but we're not necessarily going to use those hundred cans of peaches today. They may be used over the course of a few months, or a couple of weeks, or a couple of days even. But the fact is, we need to be able to track these products to make sure that we control any issues like theft. We'll discuss that more later as well. But so we'll we'll actually have a requisition system in place, where whether it's the bar or it's the kitchen, whichever part of your organisation needs the products from the storage areas, then they'll actually have some requisitions that they fill out, so that that way everything is traceable and trackable. What is the role of the buyer within an, you know, within your organisation? So let's take a look first and see what type of organisation you have, because. When you have a small company, that's generally just going to be the owner or the manager that's going to take care of that. When you have a medium-sized company, that's when you're going to have either the owner or the unit manager for that particular site who would be purchasing. Then, for a large chain company, that's when we're looking at having a purchasing vice president, a director, or a purchasing agent that would take care of those duties. So they would be performing、uh, the decision making、um, and actually、uh, actually place those orders. Uh, for purchasing, they also provide purchasing assistance as they're experts in their field.、Uh, exactly the types of things that they that are needed, who's best to buy them from, and the best processes to work your way through to get these items as well.
So they would also offer assistance to, to all the units if it's a multi-unit organization or the franchisees. So what is a franchise? Let's talk briefly about that. So a franchise is a legal business relationship. This is where you have independent owners that buy the rights to be able to use a company's name, products, and logos. So for instance, McDonald's, Domino's, Burger King, they're all great examples of, uh, of large franchise companies where an individual will own one site or two sites or three sites, but they have to pay in order to be able to use the rights to use that company name, the products and the logo that's all behind that. Well, as a, uh, as a purchasing vice president, director or purchasing agent, that individual would need to help out those individual franchisees in making their purchases, making sure that they're getting all their food and different products in the right time. So uh, a franchisee is where they market the company's goods or services, but just in their certain area. Let's talk now about the buyer and their role. So they, re they will require training, significant amounts of it as well, so that they have the knowledge and understanding of the actual operation that they're going to be purchasing for. They'll also need to know the federal and state regulations uh, on things like food quality, production, processing, labeling, transportation, and safety of all of those products too. They'll be in charge of, pro of purchasing processes and the technology that's involved with it as well. All purchasing decisions will, are going to affect all employees. We need to make sure that the purchases of the, of the right goods and services are made the first time around so that it doesn't reverberate throughout the organization in a negative way. So if a chef purchases fruit for the kitchen, well, they may also purchase fruit for the bar garnishes as well. If a bar manager purchases all the beverage for the bar, well, they may purchase some wine or some different spirits for the kitchen to cook with as well. It's all about having that cooperative and communicative setting within your organization to make sure that this is successful. Let's take a look at ethical purchasing now. So kickbacks, you may or may not have heard about these, but this is where money or other goods that are received in exchange for purchasing from a specific vendor, meaning that when a purchaser is tempted by another company to just purchase from them, then in, uh, in, uh, in appreciation for that person spending all of that company's money with them, they'll give a kickback. They may give money, they may give products or services uh, back to that individual. This is completely illegal and it's very unethical as well. You should never put yourself in this type of position. Kickbacks. Now, are you familiar with kickbacks? I, I, would, I just talked to you about this off camera. Vaguely, vaguely a little bit about, about that, but before, we, before you get into the nuts and bolts of that, one of the mistakes, though, which we did write about, was about not knowing the contracts that you have with your vendors and not getting the best possible price for uh, your bottom line, really, not theirs, um, and how to get and how to negotiate those contracts. So this is very much related to that tip. It is. 50 mistakes. It is. So chefs, and since I've been a chef, I've seen this. Since I've been in the industry, I've seen this. I saw a tr uh, heard of a truck pull up from a very reasonable, uh, resp uh, responsible, reputable resource one time. I heard the chef, uh, a meat truck pull up to the chef at, at a, from a hotel uh, out off premises and start handing them an envelope of, of $100 of bills because there was some kind of deal going on, supposedly. So I've heard about this ever since the beginning. Uh, one of my beer distributors... He told me about a restaurant, uh, not locally, but semi-locally, 30 minutes north of us in Kingston, that only buys beer from one distributor because that distributor gives them tons of Mets tickets. So why would they buy from another vendor so they don't support one of the local breweries who's in the Kingston area because that local brewery is not part of the distributor? So you're skipping a local great beer and several other local great beers because they're not part of that one distributor that you're getting your Mets tickets from. Um, that came from another reliable source. We're not going to mention any names there, but you hear you hear of these things all the time. And since I was back in the industry in Colorado in the, in the mid '90s, late '90s, I heard of a lot of things. 
Now, typically, if you buy from the big companies back in the day, I don't know how it is now, but when I bought from a food uh, group called Cisco, a big company out there, I was told that I had to buy from them for my general manager the country club. They walk in with a catalog, right? And they go, oh, look at the TV, look at the vacation, look at, you know, they go through the catalog and, and whatever it is, a bicycle, and everything has points attached to it. And the more I buy ketchup, the more I buy miners beef base, the more I buy from a certain group of foods, I get points. And then at the end of the season, or when I reach 10,000 points, I get to pick a vacation, a large screen TV, um, a bicycle. I mean, that's what it literally is. And on top of it, these companies have buying shows where I went to one of the buying shows and I didn't know I was getting anything. But after the buying show, they said, oh, you have so many points. And they take you to a room. And they're like, this is the points you have. and You can get something. I'm like, really? I mean, I, I wasn't expecting that. But chefs are expecting that. And they do take advantage of these things. Um, and I, would, I went to this food show the second year. And I made a joke like, oh, I, I, I lost my job last year because I took home that large screen TV. I was making jokes to all the suppliers, but in reality, that's what these chefs are doing. They're, they're going to these shows, they're getting they're getting suckered in from these companies, and they're taking home large screen TVs, vacations. Um, they're getting kickbacks. If you do a search on Google for kickbacks and chefs, you'll see way back to Escoffier's time, which was 100 years ago. Escoffier was the chef to kings. He was uh, the most notable classic French chef, written many books, like Guy Poulinard, which is, which is a, a must have if you're a chef, an aspiring chef, a student, uh, the Scoffier, which was his main book. He stole over $3 million in his lifetime. Um, you know, and he actually got fired from one of his jobs. But the list goes on. There's pages and pages in Google results of famous chefs, of well known chefs that are caught in these triangles of kickbacks. What are the goals of our buyers? So they are to maintain the right supply of foods, of products and services. They're to maintain the quality standards that we set in place. They're to minimize the spending that we have to do in order to, in order to purchase these items and to stay as competitive as possible. How do we maintain the right supply of food and services? Well, the worst possible scenario is that we disappoint our diners when they're ordering something only to be sold, I'm sorry, we're out of that right now. So this can become a very difficult thing for a purchaser to deal with. So custom account histories can help us to figure out the types of numbers, the kind of numbers of people that we may expect in the future. Popularity indexes of some items that are sold and vendor delivery schedules can also play a role in how we can make sure we get the food on time as well. The availability of the items from the vendors and actually getting the information before we're just told when they don't turn up that these products may not be available. And then recognizing from outside, out, recognizing outside influences that can occur with the company, things like conventions in town, festivals, weather conditions. If the weather's going to be bad, we may have less customers coming in. Or there may be construction going on right on our front doorstep. But either way, using all of this, uh, all this data, we should be able to form a fairly good picture as to what we would expect on a regular day and the kinds of products we're going to need to purchase in and the volume of those products too. So some major categories of goods and services that we purchase. So we must think about all of the various different things that we need to buy throughout the whole organization so that we can be efficient when we're purchasing. So let's take a look now at some of those categories. So we have alcoholic, alcoholic beverages. This includes spirits, liquor, as well as beer and wine. Non-alcoholic beverages, soda pop, coffee and tea, juices, bottled water. Food items, so this can be broken down into meats, poultry, eggs, processed foods, fish, dairy, produce and dairy, uh, dry and canned goods as well, are uh, ambient foods. And then our non-food items as well, linens and uniforms, bar supplies, paper goods, cleaning supplies, menus and beverage lists, candles, flowers and other uh, music that we may have either piped in or live music. Our small wares and equipment, including things like china and glassware, silverware, 
kitchen utensils and supplies, tabletop mixers, blenders, food processors, all those small pieces of equipment. And technology too, so computers, uh, and this can include our point of sale system as well, printers, fax machines, phone systems, credit card processing systems, and the security system for our company as well. Furniture, fix fixtures, and equipment all have to go through our purchasing system as well. So this will include things like tables, chairs, and bar stools, lighting fixtures, bars, cooking equipment, refrigeration, plumbing fixtures, and the HVAC, the uh, heating and air conditioning systems. Also our business supplies like office supplies and equipment. And then any business services that we may be purchasing. Things like financial and legal services we may need, our insurance uh, policies, we would need to purchase that through services that can help us to decide what we need and what will cover us best. And then marketing and advertising for the company as well. Other support services can include credit card processing services, linen and uniform rental companies, garbage removal, flower services, music services, pest control, and also parking and, and valet services. We then need maintenance services to help us to maintain all of our equipment. So this is for things like our point of sale system, our security system, cleaning services, plumbing and heating maintenance and repair, and groundskeeping, painting and carpentry, and equipment repair and maintenance too. Our utilities. Generally, most establishments will use gas, heat, electricity, telephone, and internet services. So we have to establish quality standards so that we know exactly what we want so that we can make sure our purchaser is going to purchase exactly what we want. So we have to look at both items and service uh, in terms of when we're looking at our quality standards. Our specifications need to be communicated to our vendors so that they understand to only bring us the quality that we're looking for. And that would, uh, would generally be set by the chef, the manager, or the owner of the company. Tying up large amounts of money in products can cripple an, an operation's ability to function in the present day. And this is why we need to minimize the amount of money that an operation spends on stock. So this makes our uh, cash position um, a difficult one to have to deal with, but it's something that we need to make sure we always have funds available. But So we have to make sure we don't tie too much of it up, bulking up our shelves like you see in the picture here, where we're just literally bulked up to the roof. So we need to minimize our spending. How do we do that type of thing but not run out? So that's when it comes down to having custom account forecasts, by looking at our historical uh, our historical business levels. Also looking at the available storage capacity that we have. We can't possibly look to uh, look to try and hold on to enough stock that it will like, will be overwhelmed with it. Otherwise we could end up finding that stock gets damaged either by it not being correctly frozen or refrigerated or stored and other things can get into it like vermin and bugs. We need to make sure that our forecast is in line with what our future costs may be as well. We need to make sure we protect, protect that product shelf life as best we can. Overall, our purchasing system should put us in a competitive position, especially when we're looking at our competition with other organizations. So we have to make sure that we control our costs, that we, all of our products are going to attract more guests as well. We always need to look for that competitive advantage that we, can, that we can use to put ourselves a little bit ahead. Certainly volume helps, but that's not always possible. So to stay competitive, we need to shop around for vendors. There's generally more than one company that you can go to for most products around. So you want to have the best combination of price and service, because it's not always necessarily about the cheapest, but you always want to make sure that you're going to get the best service to go with it as well. So you may uh, you also need to be able to look at what the lowest edible portion price is. So as we know, when we take a, a stem of broccoli, we know that the edible portion is generally just the florets 
and a small piece of that stem. Although, if you're really good at what you do, you may be able to use up some more of what some people would not consider to be the edible portion. However, at the end of the day, we need to make, make sure that we can maximize our yields, but also maximize the dollars and quality of what we have coming in the door. So let's go through the process of purchasing. So how do products get from the farm or the manufacturing plant to our restaurant? So generally this works its way through a channel of distribution. This is businesses that buy and sell the products from the original source and bring them to the retailer at the end of the market. So there are three main layers. We have our primary sources, which is where we're looking at farms and manufacturing plants. We have our intermediary so, uh, sources. And these are these are individual uh, individual companies that are helping with that sourcing to come bring it through the process. Maybe taking it from an entire farm load of products and breaking it down to individual containers of what we would be able to purchase on our end. And then there's retailers. That's where we are. The restaurants, possibly grocery stores, and different outlets like that as well. The primary sources are the farmers and ranchers. They raise the, the produce and livestock, and then the manufacturers who would be uh, producing products that we may be purchasing, and distillers who may actually be producing alcoholic beverages that we'll be purchasing too. Intermediary sources are the wholesalers, distributors, suppliers, middlemen, um, who buy the uh, products from primary sources and sell it to us, the retailers. Retailers sell the products directly to the public. This includes the restaurants, caterers, school cafeterias, all those type of outlets. We have two different ways of looking at the purchasing processes. We have formal and informal. So with formal purchasing methods, this is where the buyer is going to be prepare specifications that they're going to put out there and they're going to request suppliers for bids. The bids are then going to be written as specialized written uh, price lists by the suppliers. They're going to be sealed and then open publicly when all of the bids are in. Generally, a, contra a contract is then awarded to the lowest bidder or the best match bidder. Contracts are very important documents for us to use. They're legally binding business agreements. And so this is where we would have a fixed price for the goods or services that we're looking to purchase. Requests for proposal or an RFP is where we have the whole bidding process from creating specifications, offering the supplier, offering, offering to the suppliers, receiving the bids, and then awarding that contract to the specific bidder who, who either outbid or came up with the best match for that company to purchase from. Let's take a look now at an informal purchasing method. So this is a lot more simplified. This is where you're going to probably have verbal price quotes from the supplier and, a variety, and from a variety of suppliers. Once you have all of those quotes, and very often those are just like daily bids, um, then you would actually um, be able to just call, email, or fax uh, through your, uh, through your uh, purchase order that you are looking to uh, bring in. Generally, those prices are good for that day, for that specific day that they're submitted. These are uh, types of items that fluctuate in price quite, la uh, quite largely depending upon if they're in season, out of season, and how widely available they are. The purchase order is a legally binding document. This is where we list out all of our order details. So buyers can pl uh, place orders by phone, internet, or fax using a purchase order. The purchase order should have the operation's name, the address, the phone number, the buyer's name, the supplier's name, address, and phone number, the supplier's contact person, the date of the order, the desired date of the receipt, and also the shipping method preferred. The quantity for each item, the brief description of each item, the size of each item, the unit price for each item, the total price of all items, the total price of the entire order, 
and then any special information after that as well. This is a good example right here of a purchase order. So it has Tony's Restaurant Supply and all the details written up at the top. It talks about the specific vendor that they're going to be using. And then it runs down the list of all of the specific things that they're going to be purchasing, including the price, the unit price, and the quantity as well. Just so that way, everybody who gets to see their purchase order is fully aware of what's expected and what's needed um, to be delivered to your company. So before we go shopping to purchase items, we need to go vendor shopping. This is where your company needs to consider the operations needs. So the quality standards that, are, that you're looking for, the restaurant type, the number of guests you'll be servicing, the service period, the availability of skilled labor, and the budget and menu pricing that we're looking through as well. In step two of vendor shopping, that's when we're gonna research those vendors see what kind of price ranges for items frequently used, the quality of the customer service that you would receive, the delivery schedule that's available, and the ease of ordering as well. And then as well as that, the satisfa satisfaction level of long-term customers. And you can ask for references in this case as well. So step three is when we're actually starting to build those relationships. We're gonna try some sample products, talk with peers, check references, make small orders at first to make sure that they can handle those things before we put our trust fully into them. We also have to know our food prices. So time value is where you have the time of delivery. And so if you need to you need that food to come in at seven o'clock in the morning when your kitchen opens so that you can have the food ready for when your restaurant opens, then the time of delivery can be vital. If you need more product in for lunch service, and that food won't be delivered until halfway through lunch, it's not gonna work for you. The form value, this is where the uh, uh, where you may be purchasing in bulk versus, versus buying just individual bottles of ketchup, say, and uh, where it may work for you to purchase more because you may get a better price, but then do you have enough storage for all of those types of things? And then also the place value. The shipping location uh, from where that food or where those products are coming from, if it's a significant distance from you, that could create significantly more cost, especially if you need to have those things quickly brought over to you because they may spoil. Things like fish uh, have to be transported rapidly because they only have a very short shelf life. But if you live a long way inland, say in Missouri, and you're looking to get, sh uh, you're looking to get some seafood, then it could be very expensive because you have to have it shipped in by plane as opposed to be just trucked in on land. Look at the transportation value. Quick and expensive or slow and cheap. Whichever way you need to have it so that the product is in the best quality but you get the best deal with it as well. You also need to look at the service value too. So convenience services. There are things like 24-hour toll-free number, call lines, so you could always speak with the agents so that you can always uh, be able to get everything you need at any time of the day. It may be convenience foods, getting pre-cored lettuce or special cuts of meat because you don't have a butcher on site to be able to take care of things like that. Knowing food prices and knowing the impact on those food prices is very, very important to understand for a purchaser. Political efforts can create issues, federal laws can create other issues. The weather can change everything on a dime. So we need to be able to understand uh, the, where we may have higher demand for certain things may end up making our pricing go up. If we have uh, less supply of certain things, we may end up finding that we end up having a higher price as well because there's more people looking for it then there is products available. So this is where we have a supply and demand economic imbalance. So what if you have strawberries in June? They should be very cheap because they're abundant. As long as that crop has been successful, we're going to have lots of strawberries in June. However, in January, they're going to be very scarce and you're not going to get any locally to where we are. We'll have to purchase them from California 
or possibly even uh, further afield than you know, than the United States. And so these can get extremely expensive and probably not be of a very good quality. But you can also have it where things like a bad crop in Brazil uh, of coffee might make it where there's lower availability and so that will drive up costs as well because if the demand is still there and there's not enough product to go around then someone's going to purchase it and that's only generally if they're willing to pay a premium. Now we're going to take a look at commodities and how commodities can affect our everyday business cycle. So this includes uh, all sorts of different types of products and so this can be an economic good, and when I say good, I mean goods and products. And so this is a product of agriculture or mining. So when we look at agriculture, we're talking about things like corn, wheat, um, and then um, sugar, soybeans. But then we can also have mining as well. That can include things like oil, steel, and aluminum, or aluminium, as I like to say it back in England. Um, but then we have commodity price risks that can actually adversely affect our plans. So this can be an, there can be increases in commodity prices, um, so that may mean that we end up uh, having to increase our prices on our menu, even if we have an inelastic um, uh, economy going on. We just have to do things um, to make sure that our business stays in business. All these things can cause increases in price uh, to products and other goods as well. We are here to try to explain to you what it is we do here. We are commodities brokers, William. Now, what are commodities? Commodities are agricultural products, like coffee that you had for breakfast, wheat, which is used to make bread, pork bellies, which is used to make bacon, which you might find in a bacon and lettuce and tomato sandwich. If we just take one of those commodities, oil, we can actually see where it takes up more than just the one thing we might be thinking of, gasoline, to fill our cars. It can actually have a drastic effect on every aspect of our lives. Plastics are made from oil, so one could say that it wakes us up in the morning. And of course, it heats our homes. Oil is also very useful in our bathroom, where it's part of our morning hygiene. After providing us with breakfast, products made from oil keep us warm outside the house by insulating our clothes and shoes. When we go about our daily life, oil is right there with us. We all know that petroleum fuels our cars and lets us drive safely wherever we wish to go. We also come across petroleum byproducts in most stores, including drug stores. Oil is invaluable to medicine and the pharmaceutical industry. Back at the office, products made from oil and its byproducts are all around, making our life and work easier. They're there in thousands of everyday details which we rarely think about. When it comes to transportation, petroleum and its derivatives are unquestionably the lead stars over land, over sea, and across the skies. And what about our home kitchen? Let's think about it for a minute. The furniture, the equipment, the utensils. If one looks further afield, oil derivatives are used to protect crops from diseases, pests, and other threats. Petroleum products can be found all around our living rooms. And at the beach in the summer, they're all over the place, helping us enjoy our holidays. One of the keys to purchasing is to be able to understand exactly what it is that we're looking for and having our specs, our standards in place to get the right thing. So let's look through some of these standards.
So quality, that's the value or the worth of the actual product itself. The customers uh, place, what the customers place on that product or service, whether it's, uh, they look at it as high or low quality, or somewhere in the middle. Just as an example, a $2 burger won't have prime, uh, prime beef in it, because it was only $2, and, and prime beef costs significantly more than that. But it must be safe to consume. So there have to be standards involved at any price. We have to establish solid quality standard specifications for our products. So we create consistency in our products. We create uh, that for every single product. And the managers, buyers, and vendors all have to be on point to understand what that is. So that, that way we get that standard and that consistency throughout. But determining our quality standards in includes having to look at the item's intended use, the operations concept, and goals, the menu, the employee's skill level that will be able to work with the products we get for them, the budgetary constraints that we may have, because every business has a budget to keep, and then the equipment constraints, what's available to be able to be used in our kitchen, in our restaurant, and then what the guests wants and needs, depending on your demographics and your desires within your company. And then seasonal availability as well. And storage capacity is always going to be an influence. The most influential factor that's going to be at play is de in determining what the quality standards are, is determining what the quality standards are going to be offered and how they're going to be prepared, and how they're going to be served. A great example is strawberries. So when we look at this picture right here, we don't need to get the best quality strawberries in order to make the coulis that's running around this dessert, but we have to have the best quality to place those slices of delicate strawberry right on top of the dessert as our garnish. So depending on exactly what we're using it for, will depend on the standard that we need to purchase. The overall concepts and goals of the organization play a key factor as well. They guide our decision. Is this a quick service restaurant, a casual dining restaurant, or an up upscale restaurant, which is going to require very, very different needs in their equipment? They're going to have different skill levels of employees who are going to use the equipment. And they're going to be producing different types of uh, food pro products as well. So you want to have the right products for the right foods in the right restaurant. Specifications must match our menu. So our, our brand name on the menu and it must match the operations quality standards as well. The employee skill level is key because uh, we, we, we generally would have extensive preparations in our high-end restaurants. This way you're going to be paying high skilled employees to make some very delicate dishes and you're going to have to pay them higher wages. With lower skilled level, uh, skill levels that's generally where you're going to have to purchase convenience products to be able to use because you may not have the skill level to be able to take care of certain uh, certain projects and certain uh, preparations. So you're going to be paying lower wages to those lower skilled individuals. So this can be um, increased product costs because you're having to buy more convenience foods in. Budgetary constraints are something that every restaurant has to deal with, one way or another. But restaurants in highly competitive markets can really get squeezed, and they have to look at what their cost limit is to that quality standard. Will they be able to buy an, a better quality piece of fish? But if you have customers who are priced inelastic, who cannot afford to pay any more for that piece of fish, you may need to look at other things. So this is where we have to look at consistent menu pricing um, as well. And so if you have consistent menu pricing, but you find that this nice piece of halibut is in season between March and about November, then you're probably not going to be able to purchase this and actually know that your price is going to be consistent and be able to hold a consistent menu price. We also avoid uh, products with drastic price changes 
things like fruits and vegetables that may come and go in seasons and out of seasons. We have to analyze and track different trends that are going on around in our world. Surveys and feedback forms can give us information. Review websites as well to see what's going on in the world um, because we need to be influenced by the industry and consumer trends so that we're keeping up with what's going on. Seasonal availability is a massive issue for us to be able to tackle when it comes to purchasing. So produce and other items have huge seasonality to them. And so this can affect the price and availability drastically. Sometimes we may have the need to purchase twice what we purchased the previous week. But this can come, in, you know, come as an issue if we're finding that the price is now doubled. And so can we afford to double our price on our menu to go along with that? And certainly changes in quality standards uh, can have a, a marked effect on us if we're trying to purchase fruits which are out of season. And then uh, any changes in our menu, you might want to make them so that you stay within seasonality to reflect these changes in foods that are available at uh, ripe and at the right time of year. Our storage capacity has a big effect on what we can purchase too. Between frozen, refrigerated and ambient room temperature foods, we have to be able to store them correctly. This can affect the quality if we don't. Between canned, fresh and frozen foods, we can end up having foods which can go bad if they spoil because they're not in the right place. But also, if we don't have enough storage capacity for certain things in refrigerators, then we may have to get frozen, we may have to get canned, and they generally have a lower quality standard um, to them, and so that can maybe have something that we have to uh, choose between, depending on what the season is, and the capacity we have to store everything. So when we're writing our specifications, we have to determine the quality standards that we're looking for in our suppliers. So we create product specifications for every product that we're looking to purchase. We document the product specifications. So for small operations, you're going to inform, uh, you're going to have an informal specifications uh, listing with few details in them. But for larger operations, that's when you're going to have formal and precise specifications because you may have several people relying upon those to tell them what they should and shouldn't purchase or deliver to us. Always use approved, reputable suppliers for everything you purchase, whether it's a large or a small organization. When it comes to writing those specifications, the buyers, we want them to be familiar with those specifications, with the quality standards that we're looking for. With our product, product specifications, we want to communicate this with our staff and vendors so anyone who's checking the food in, anyone who's delivering the food, will know exactly what's going to be expected. We have to train our managers and, and receiving employees to understand exactly what their role is in making sure that the food that comes in is exactly what we want. Vendors need to be able to meet those product specifications. If they can't, it's time to look for another vendor. In our written specifications, we look for well-written specifications to actually go over details of exactly what we want. We want to prevent low quality items from coming into our restaurant or substandard quality. We want to prevent wrong items from coming in as well because that just causes inefficiencies within the business and sometimes outages in the foods that we're looking to purchase. We want to avoid overly rigid specifications that can mean we end up not having product in um, and, and having to have food that's out of stock when it could be in but we just may have to choose something slightly different, maybe a brand name or something like that. Brand names play key things in our purchases though. So as you can see, from pieces of equipment like these Electrolux ovens, down to just food items as well. Packers name brands are the own, name, own brand names that uh, the, individual, um, the individual suppliers may have as well. Rather than Kellogg's, it may be uh, an, an individual Cisco brand product instead. There are many quality levels with all of these types of food items as well, so you have to make sure that you ask for the correct items so that we can we maintain consistency.
Make sure in our specifications that we talk about what color we want to have, what flavor differences we may have uh, and may choose from as well. We need to make sure we describe exactly what our intended use is so that that way our purchaser understands what kinds of foods can be substituted and what ones are rigid that we must get. So we have to be able to use these to, uh, in, in order for how we're going to use the products, prepare the products and consume the products. So this, this, this will drive our selection decision making as to what types of things we can use. If we're using strawberries and a strawberry milkshake, they don't have to look pretty. But if we're using that strawberry for the garnish on top of the milkshake, it's got to look perfect. What market forms are we purchasing these in? Are these going to be in uh, small little packets? Um, or is it going to be desiccated, shredded, canned? What type of form will that vegetable or fruit come in? Or the meat or any other products that we're purchasing? The packaging that it comes in. So the intended use may be packets of ketchup instead of jars for to-go orders. Maybe uh, standardized packaging as well that we need to get. Sometimes those, that packaging may be for protective reasons like eggs. The place of origin can play a key part in it all of our decision making as well. Textures and flavors of specific items can be a very regional type of taste that may, may be difficult to get hold of in certain parts of the country. Products for certain, from certain places as well, like local farms and dairies, can be something we might want to choose from as long as they're available. And then size, weight, and volume counts on the, um, on the actual products as well. You may be looking for very specific weights, or it may be that you purchase things in units. Well, just beware, because from some businesses, that unit may be something like a 150 count box, or another company may sell a 12 dozen box. Very similar, very close, but not exactly the same. Make sure you know exactly what you're getting so that you can compare apples to apples. When we get these products in, we have to make sure that they're being held to the correct temperatures. This is very often a safety issue if they're not being held to the right temperature. We, uh, we can safeguard against these types of things by what well, you can see in the picture here. We can be taking temperatures when foods first come in um, to make sure that they haven't been abused. Make sure you train employees um, on how to check temperatures correctly. Also, be on the, look, on the lookout for USDA grading of certain foods as well. And so, but also be aware that there are different terms for inspection stamps which indicate for safety. Um, as, as apart from grading stamps, which are things like prime um, or choice beef and grade A or grade B milk. Should we make or buy the food? So this is where we have to make an analysis to make that decision. So do we make it from scratch, something like these buttermilk pancakes? Or do we buy a ready-made version or some ready, ready mix to go and make them with as well? We have to make some balances within food production, with quality standards as well and make that decision depending on what the business is all about. Ready-made products can provide consistency. They can reduce our prep time, the labor costs, the equipment needs and the storage space that we may or may not have, but they do generally cost more money than if we buy the bare commodities. We have to determine the cost of making in-house, so looking at all of the ingredients, the processing to produce that food, the labor that's involved, and then all other associated costs like fuel to bake things and things like that. We have to compare those to ready-made items to see if we're actually getting the best deal, the best price, and the best quality product. So when should we order? So quality forecasting really does help us with this. So we need to have good data. If we don't have good data about our past purchases, then it's not going to help us in the future. We want this to be able to help us to reduce errors in over-ordering or under-ordering for the future. Production records are important for this. So we want to be able to have forecast um, buying needs. We want to be able to know what our production sheets are so that we're knowing what we're planning on producing. 
We also have our daily food cost sheets that we can analyze as well, and our sales mix records so that we know how many of each item on the menu on average we're selling. Our production sheets, this is where a chef fills these out for the upcoming weeks. It lists all of the menu items that we prepare for on any given day. At the end of the day, the chef will adjust it to actually reflect what actually happened. And then we give this to the buyer. That way the buyer, the purchaser, can actually start working out on average what we're selling of these menu items so that they can be more prepared when they're purchasing. It's a great forecasting tool to be able to use. Buyers use production sheets to spot things like stock outs uh, when we're running out of an item or overproduction when we're making too much of any particular food that leads to food waste and affects the food cost percentage. Daily food cost sheets can then be worked into daily and monthly food costs as well so that we can start working out how to limit food waste. So by using our daily food costs we can add our requisitions that we've been taking from our storage and, and the daily purchases as well and we can divide our daily sales figure and then we can get our daily food cost percentage. This can help us to be more analytical um, to make sure that we are on track with what with all of our purchases for that month. By creating a daily food cost percentage, a chef or a manager can actually compare costs over time. In general, we want to stay at or below 33% with our costs. That's around the industry standard. And so if we see any large changes, like over, that could be overproduction, it could be food waste, waste, it could be theft as well. This is where we'll be looking at our sales mix records. And so we're going to be tracking items that are sold from our menu. And we've used this before in menu engineering. This is where we can actually start taking note of any leaders of the items that sell well or losers of the items that are not selling well. Decide on why it is they're not selling well. Maybe it's time for them to move out. or Maybe it's time to adjust them. Par stock is the ideal amount of inventory items in order for us to have stock at all times of that particular item. What's the par stock approach? So or the ordering process and delivery schedule, the par stock level for each item that we're purchasing, and also calculating how much to order when we actually hit that par level. So there should be a reorder point as well if you don't want to use the par stock approach. So these are warning bells. This is an alert that we should uh, make an order immediately of that particular item when it falls to a certain level. This can be used with par stock processes as well. Receiving. So this is where we need to make sure that we're inspecting, accepting or rejecting goods and services. And so this uh, this should be an efficient, safe and effective process. And it's not going to be if you have staff who don't understand this. So make sure you train your employees so that they understand exactly how to check things in and make sure that all these things are safe and efficiently done as well. We need to make sure we have a clean, well-maintained receiving area. Invoices are documents that are given with all deliveries. It's a list of goods ordered and the price that we're going to pay for them. If we are closed when the food is being delivered, you may get a key drop delivery. Make sure that you, ins you inspect all of these items, but you have to, in the first place, be able to trust that delivery company to make sure that they're not going to drop off the wrong types of foods with the wrong standards. So this is when you're going to be getting deliveries when, when, you're, when you're closed, probably between midnight and 6 a.m. So as soon as you arrive, you must inspect all of that food before you put it away, just to make sure that it is of the standard you're looking for. So efficient receiving guidelines are important as well. Plan ahead for shipments. Make sure that you're available and, and have clean hand trucks, carts and dollies on hand. Space in walk-ins and storerooms uh, to be able to store them. And then inspect and, and store each uh, delivery before the other one starts to arrive as well. Don't get mixed up between orders because you may miss something which is important. 
Here are some efficient receiving guidelines. So as soon as deliveries come in, make sure you inspect them immediately. Count the quantities, check for any damaged products, anything that's been repackaged or manhandled, mishandled uh, in the process of being delivered to you. Spot check weights to make sure that you're not being swindled in any kind of way. Make sure you take temperatures, make sure that food is safe. And make sure you check expiration dates as well. That milk may only have a couple of days left on the shelf life when you should get something that has about a two-week shelf life. Make sure that you record all items on receiving sheets. So this receiving form example is a good one just to show what goes on to here. So as well as the date, the purchase order number, the received from and the address from where it's going to be coming from. But the important part here is looking at the quantity, the item number, and the description of that item so that whoever is receiving that can actually make note that yes it's all come in and it's of the standard that's expected. Here are some efficient receiving guidelines to carry on with the others. So we have correct mistakes immediately. We want to put away um, items very quickly whether they're refrigerated, frozen or ambient to make sure that the food quality is maintained. Make sure you maintain that receiving area so that it's easy to use, light, nice lights all around, and you've got the correct equipment, things like scales, to be able to measure them. Make sure you reject any products or shipments um, and set them aside if they're not of the standard that we're looking for. Make sure you tell that delivery person um, because they're going to be able to uh, use the purchase agreement to go and check that they're not hitting the right specifications and get a signed adjustment on your invoice to make sure that you're going to get money back from the products you're, you're not going to be taking. Or a credit memo will work as well. Make sure there's a written record that that food was rejected. Make sure that you ensure that the vendor is going to credit you um, and credit that organization so that you're not paying for that food when you're sending it back. Make sure you to log the incident on an invoice so that it can be double checked as well. Here's a credit memo here. And so the important part here is to show where we have 12 inch dinner plates. There was one case which is being credited back. Maybe it was broken. We have seven and a quarter inch salad plates. One case of those that were sent back. Maybe that one was dropped too. Before a purchase is placed, the buyer must identify the terms of service which is expected. You need to establish the daily schedules, the product consistency, and the specifications or substitutions that you will accept. Buyers should be talking with the receiving employees regularly. They're a great source of information about the vendor. Did they deliver on time with the right temperatures, quality, etc. Make sure you stay in contact with the vendor as well to report any issues that may be coming up. Insist on good service. Keep them honest. And that's how you'll consistently get the best quality and the best price. If you see things slipping, make sure they're aware you may have to make a change. With perishable, perishable products, make sure that you check them for spoil or decay within a short period of time. Damaged by bacteria, light or air um, means that foods will have to be disposed of um, before you may even be able to use them up. Different uh, perishable products are things like meats, fish, poultry, dairy, eggs, produce, and alcoholic beverages. Make sure you purchase them more often. This is when we would use a JIT kind of format for our purchasing. This is just in time. So rather than purchasing enough fish for the next six months and freezing half of it so that it gets freezer burned, we may, do, uh, we may purchase this with a just in time process by where when we run out of that food, we purchase more of it. Now looking at non-perishable products, so these are the items that don't support bacterial growth. So canned products and processed products that, um, that won't have that type of issue that can be stored in a storeroom. So these can also be bottled products, dried goods. Um, so we can purchase these in large quantities and less frequently, weekly, bi-weekly or even monthly. Watch out for any fluctuations uh, with the market uh, and price. But generally with these types of things, we can purchase them year-round. We don't have to worry about seasonality.
We have three different types of storage areas that we're maintaining in our kitchen. So we have refrigerated, so that's at 41 or below. We have frozen, so we have to make sure we keep frozen right around zero degrees Fahrenheit. And then dry storage, this is where we keep our dry and canned foods, so those ambient temperatures. When it comes to caring for our refrigerated storage, we must make sure we set the correct temperature, so 41 or below Fahrenheit. Um, we must make sure that we check that temperature at least once a shift. Monitor the food temperature, not just the refrigerated temperature. Make sure you schedule regular maintenance to take care of your equipment. Don't overload coolers. This prevents airflow and it will actually mean that your food will start going bad quicker because it's not getting cooled down properly. Use open shelving. Don't be tempted to line your shelves because you don't want them to get dirty, but always make sure that airflow can flow all the way through your refrigerator. Keep cooler doors closed and make sure you wrap or cover food correctly. When it comes to frozen storage, make sure it's at zero or below so that food is properly frozen. Uh, check the temperatures regularly again. Put food away immediately. You know, food that's left out is going to thaw and then you may have some issues of time and temperature abuse and quality. Use open shelving to allow the airflow. Make sure you defrost regularly so that your uh, machine is working um, nice and efficiently as well. Make sure you clearly label products. Once they're frozen, it may be difficult to know exactly what they are. When it comes to dry storage, keep storerooms clean and dry. Temperature should be between about 50 and 70 Fahrenheit. Make sure they're well ventilated. Store foods away from the walls and at least six inches off the floor and completely out of direct sunlight. Some general guidelines, so store in, uh, in appropriate containers, make sure they're durable, leak proof, sealed and covered. Never put food into chemical containers, even if you're positive that you can clean that chemical completely out, it's not worth the risk of some residual chemical getting onto your food. Never put chemicals into food containers either, because then that food container is now ruined from being able to store food in again. Create proper air circulation throughout. Make sure that your shelves are at least six inches off the floor and the shelves are away from the ceiling and the walls. Keep food away from chemicals. We always store our chemicals in a completely separate area of the kitchen so that they don't have any of these types of issues. Make sure that you can transfer the items um, into unsealed containers to airtight containers so that they don't start to deteriorate and protect them against insects and vermin. Use strong shelving. Uh, make sure that you use professional pest control operators so that any kind of issues of issues are being done properly. Um, cleaning and sweeping all your areas is important. Follow FIFO, first in, first out. So those, those cans of beans, even though they keep for a significant length of time, we're going to make sure that we use the oldest ones up first and the newest ones up after that. Correctly store perishable food properly. Make sure that you have the correct temperature and humidity levels maintained for them. Inventory is a record of our products in storage and in our kitchen. So we have different methods for purchasing non-perishable foods. So we can actually keep a physical inventory method or a perpetual inventory method. The physical inventory method is where we're literally looking at every single stock item and reviewing them and counting them. We can determine this to then help us to reorder various different products as well. With a perpetual inventory method, this is where we record items when they're received. We record items when they're used up. And that information is kept on receiving and issuing sheets or logs. This is an example here of a perpetual inventory method in use. So we have canned tomatoes and we have all of our different types of canned tomatoes and we have the cost per case, the units, uh, the cost per unit and the selling price 
and then we work our way all the way across throughout here so we can analyze as we're using food up uh, within our perpetual inventory. The differences between both of these methods comes down to the perpetual inventory is an estimate of the stock that's on hand. It doesn't calculate the actual costs or the inventory value. The physical inventory method, however, is the actual count of the items in stock. So this is where we can use this to calculate reliable financial data and actual costs and inventory value as well. So this can give us a more precise amount with our physical inventory method, but the perpetual inventory method can help us day by day to have a good understanding of our food cost involved. When we're issuing from storage, make sure that you have an official procedure so that everyone understands what's expected. When you're taking foods out of your storeroom and putting them into production, this can help us to prevent stealing, pilfering from occurring. Any employees who are caught stealing should be fired, and in, in gross cases, it could even involve having them being arrested and convicted of that theft as well. Let's take a quick look at some inventory systems. So this is where we're going to use these to calculate the food usage, food costs and losses as well. How much do we need to order and how often? We would generally have a selected period for calculations, either days, weeks or months. And so we would, uh, our inventory would be measured at the start of that period. We'd have new orders that we would receive during that inventorying period. The inventory at the end of that period to close it out. And so then we'll take the usage by adding um, add the starting inventory plus the, in, uh, the items received and minus our ending inventory to give us the sum of the amounts of the items that we've used. This is a good example right here. So our starting inventory item was 18 cases. We received during that period 22 more cases. So we have a total of 40 cases total during this period. Our ending inventory was 32. So that means that we used 8 during this time period. So when we're calculating our food cost, on September 1st, our starting inventory was $32,333 worth. On September 7th, so a week into it, these are our cost of goods that we received. And then after that, on September 14th, we received some more. And on the 21st, we received more. And the 28th, we received more. So in total, from our starting inventory and the other received goods, we have a total of $71,784 worth of food. On October 1st, we closed out our inventory. And so that inventory showed that we had $30,577 worth of food in the, in the house at that time. So that would mean from our September 1st to the 30th, we had a total cost of our food of $41,207. It's possible by using this method to actually see if your restaurant is making a loss or if it's p potentially making a profit. So we can determine if the restaurant is operating at a loss or a potential profit by taking the total cost of the food, let's say from September, it was $41,207. The restaurant had food sales of $39,886. This will mean that our loss uh, would have been. 39,866 minus 41,207 will give us a loss of $1,341. The total cost of the food in October now, though, was 41,207, with a total sales of $125,000. So this would mean that we would take the $83,793 um, and would be our profit. Now, that would be a gross profit, meaning that it's profit before other costs have been deducted, because we had that 125000 minus 41207 to give us a gross profit of 83793 
We can also calculate, if we're making a loss, any inventory shrinkage that we may have. This is where you have to have very tight control um, on exactly how food is being issued from your storage and used in your kitchen and other parts of your operation. So this is when you're going to be analyzing the difference between your total cost of goods and the cost of goods that have been issued. So as you can see, our total cost of food was $41,207, but the total cost of the food that was issued from our stores is $40,763. This means that we have a difference of $444 that was never issued from those stores, but that was consumed in some sort of way. Could be theft, could have been uh, incorrectly keyed information, or incorrectly analyzed information. But one way or another, you need to find out what's happening there, because this can eat away at your profits, or it can put you into a loss. Some people think that restaurant and food service purchasing is like shopping in a mall. Just make a list of things you want, go buy them, and you are done. Easy, right? In reality, it's not that simple. The purchasing process is a lot more complex, and smart restaurant and food service managers know this. The purchasing function is everything involved in buying products and services. This is also referred to as the procurement process and has five steps. The first major step is to determine what an operation wants and needs to buy. Buyers work with managers to understand what they should order, usually on a regular basis. This includes items that are ordered frequently, like flour and sugar for a bakery, but also includes major one-time purchases, like a new convection oven. Next, the buying team identifies quality standards that fit the goals of the operation. These are the agreed upon requirements for products and services, like buying a certain orange to make freshly squeezed juice. Quality standards help to build the specifications, or specs, the detailed descriptions of all the characteristics required to fill a purchase need. For example, quality standard specs for a convection oven might include details on the type of electricity output needed or special items to fit a particular building code. It could also mean buying specific products, like vanilla beans from Madagascar or butter from locally sourced dairy products. Quality standards are developed so suppliers provide the right products and services. The next step in procurement is to order products and services. This is how an operation orders the items they need. This is often determined by the size of the operation. Some smaller restaurants might place orders over the phone, while other large operations may have a more formal process with computer systems and purchase orders. After ordering products or services, an operation receives the deliveries. This is where things like the quality standards and specs come into play. It is important to train staff to inspect all deliveries before they are accepted or refused. They must also verify that the products meet the operation's specifications. Following receiving, the final step in the procurement process is to store and issue the products as quickly as possible. Proper storage prevents food safety problems and waste and helps keep track of inventory. Issuing systems track which areas are using which products and help to control theft. For example, requisitions are used to formally request products. Employees fill out the form listing exactly what products they need and then give the paperwork to whoever is in charge of the inventory. How effective an operation is in executing these steps directly affects its success. The number of factors involved in purchasing decisions can be confusing. However, with experience and attention to detail, Full understanding is more than possible. Okay, let's rewrap this purchasing process and the 10 steps that we follow. So we begin pur the purchasing process by reviewing or planning our menus. We want to look at the quality and quantity that we're going to be needing, the past stock levels that we're going to need, the specifications of quality standards that we're looking for. Check our inventory records, supplies on hand, and the supplies that we actually need. Request prices, bids, or quotes from these businesses. Select suppliers. The services, the price, and the product quality are all key important things to consider. Make sure we prepare 
purchase orders uh, so that we, when we're placing the orders, other people in our organization will know exactly what to be looking for when it's delivered. Use proper receiving procedures. Make sure that you uh, review the invoice, accept or reject the delivery, and have a receiving log. Store items properly and make sure you rotate your stock. First in, first out. FIFO. Requisition form should always be used so that, that way we're maintaining our stock because that's very valuable to the company and using past stock guidelines so that we can reorder supplies and begin that process again. Cities have reorganized themselves, allowing less and less traffic inside city walls. Logistic centers have been built around the city in order to rationalize transport. Out of home consumption has grown and the F&B industry had to adapt to new consumption habits. Dietary requirements are now at the center of everyone's eating habits. According to One Lifestyle, any restaurant would provide you with the perfect meal according to your needs. Welcome in Food Town a beautiful city of around 100,000 souls. In order to reduce their cost, four restaurants in the city have done a partnership to organize their purchasing function. The Fat Burger, the Raw Carrot, Le Petit Paris, and the local factory's canteen called the Happy Worker have appointed John as the common purchasing manager. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, it's Nicolas from Le Petit Paris. I need to trail again. Could you check with our former supplier if he could deliver the same quality? Hi, John. I absolutely need a cheaper beef supplier. All right. Uh, I'll check my supplier list to see what I can find for you. I'll send you an offer within the hour. With comparison, of course, of prices and nutritional facts. Mark, do you need it processed or organic? You can go with processed. I really need to lower my food cost. Consumers are very price sensitive. Hello, this is Meat Good Meat. If so, you tested our processed beef stick K452. Did you like it? Yes, indeed. What's your best price? Would you like with or without added vitamins? I think without. We're really looking for the price here. All right. We can offer you $15 per kilogram. Oh, I have another supplier at $14.50. Uh, $14.50. Uh, we can give you $14.50 if you buy more than 100 kilograms per week. Okay, that's a deal. Hi Tony. Hi John, how are you? I'm good, thanks. I just received your cockerels and they all weigh 400 grams instead of 450, like they used to be. Why is that? Oh, that's because of the new hygiene regulation, the one which has been effective for a couple of months now, you know? I had to slaughter them a bit earlier than I used to, because you have to take a few days to sanitize the installations between each batch of cockerels. Oh, I see. And you still feed them organic corn? Yes, they still have the organic label. That's not about to change. Okay, great. Well, it's always a pleasure to work with you, Tony. Have a nice day. Thanks, you too. As we can see, there's a lot riding on that position of being a purchaser within any company on the success or failure of that, of that organization. So it's really important that we understand 
and that we know and we study everything that's involved if you're going to hold that position. And that position may not just be a purchaser, it may be the executive chef in that in that restaurant, it may be the bar manager in that restaurant, that you have key roles in purchasing while you're there. Make sure that you use that time wisely to help that company. You make all the difference. I hope you understood everything. If you need uh, to ask any questions, please do. Apart from that, I will see you in the kitchen. Cheers.